Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous dream girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High School, and although like most of our teachers, she possesses a higher-than-average intelligence, she also possesses the higher-than-average curiosity of most of our women, especially when it comes to weighing machines. There's nobody more concerned about the result than a female who has just deposited her penny in the slot. Unless it's the male tub of lard who was on the scale when I got there. <laughs> this happened last Wednesday after school. I was passing the drugstore and just happened to have a penny on me. Tuesday was payday. <laughs> So I approached the weighing machine, and like I said, this brewery horse was stomping on the springs. And when he saw his weight on the little card, he looked around the drugstore, then made tracks for a sign saying girdle department. I calmly stepped aboard, and when my card came out, I glanced casually at my weight, chuckled as if to say, how much accuracy can you expect for a cent? <laughs> and was just about to throw the card away when I noticed my fortune printed on the back. It said... A tall, dark man is coming into your life. Then, of course, I did drop the card. It landed in my purse, and I proceeded on home. <laughs> By the next morning, I'd forgotten about it completely. As usual, I'd left word for Mrs. Davis, my landlady, to wake me at 7.30. Connie! Oh, Connie! Oh, what is it? Better hurry, Connie. You've only got 20 minutes. 20 minutes? What time is it? 7.10, and you've only got 20 minutes to sleep. Oh, fine. <laughs> well, come on in, Mrs. Davis. Did you have a good night, Connie? I said, did you have a good night? Good night, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> you better get up now, Connie. Here, I've brought you some fruit juice. Go on, Connie, take a sip. Oh, what kind of juice is this? It's a combination. Pineapple, papaya, and passion fruit. <laughs> It's a genuine Hawaiian recipe. What do you stir it with, a ukulele? <laughs> After you drink it, we'll have a nice... Why, Connie, what's that little white card? What little white card? This one here on your night table. Let's see, it says, uh, A tall, dark man is coming into your life. Now, who do you suppose that could be? Well, it's not Sonny Tough. He's a blonde. <laughs> Maybe they mean Mr. Philip Boynton. The bashful biologist? No, Mrs. Davis, so far he's managed to remain in the suburbs of my life. <laughs> well, of course, I don't believe in fortunes on cards and crystal gazing and palm reading and all that nonsense. There is, however, a logical and scientific way to arrive at certain conclusions about one's personal destiny. What's that, Mrs. Davis? Tea leaves. <laughs> now... You hurry and get dressed, and I'll brew the tea. After breakfast, I'll give you a reading. All right, Mrs. Davis. Oh, just a minute. What is it, Connie? Before I get out of bed, you better take that tall, dark man off my night table. <laughs> Finished with your tea, Connie? Yes, Mrs. Davis. Mm, let's see now. Where are the leaves? Well, most of them are in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Here we are. There's plenty left for a reading. First, we revolve the cup three times slowly between our hands, then quickly turn it over onto the saucer. There. Well, what do you know? The weight card was right. What? There he is, right there in the cup, the tall, dark man who's coming into your life. Don't tell me you can't see him. Oh, of course. For a minute, I didn't recognize him with all those tea leaves on. <laughs> This is an amazing coincidence, Connie. I'd like to get another reading, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Davis. It's always nice to be sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, what do you know about that? I know, he's gone. Left town without even saying goodbye. <laughs> oh, Connie, be serious. This is an amazing thing I see in this cup. What now, Mrs. Davis? Uh, I don't think I should tell you. Why not? Because you're not even married yet. Oh, but I'm a big girl now. <laughs> I'll have to find out sooner or later. I never would have believed it. Three of them. Three tall, dark men? No, Constance. Three little ones. Three little dark men? <laughs> Children. 
you're going to have three children. Well, don't look so shocked, Mrs. Davis. Maybe they're his by a former marriage. <laughs> no, no, Connie, they're yours. But how can you keep your job at school if you've got to take care of... Oh, I know. I'll get Mrs. Fletcher. When my niece Bertha had the twins, <laughs> Mrs. Fletcher took over completely. Oh, now, just a minute, Mrs. Davis. Don't you now, think now it's a Now, quiet, soon? honey. You can't prepare... <laughs> you can't prepare too soon for this sort of thing. Now, where did I put Mrs. Fletcher's phone number? I better call... I don't the... want Mrs. Fletcher. I'll take care of my kids myself. <laughs> yes, that's the way you want it, honey. After all, I'm only trying to be helpful. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Davis. This tea leaf business is pretty fascinating. But I better get ready. Walter Denton's giving me a lift to school again. Oh, is your car in the repair shop, Connie? Yes, it is. What's wrong with it this time? Well, I can't be sure, but I think that Joe the mechanic and my car are that way about each other. <laughs> Every time I try to separate them, the car blows a gasket. Oh, there's Walter now. I'll be right with you, Walter. Oh, before you go, Connie, please do me one favor. Certainly, what is it? Promise me you'll be very careful today. Careful? Oh, you mean about my fortune. Mrs. Davis, I give you my word of honor, I'll let you know in plenty of time to call Mrs. Fletcher. <laughs> Walter, it's very nice of you to keep driving me to school like this. Oh, that's all right, Miss Brooks. I don't like to take advantage of the fact that because your car is incapacitated and I can jump into the breach now and then, transportation-wise, that is, you can't very well refuse gracefully, but I'm telling you, you can before I even ask you. That's square enough, isn't it? Square as things since Clyde McCoy. <laughs> but being an English teacher, I practically understand you, Walter. Just what kind of advice do you need this morning? Oh, it's a girl. What's a girl? Harriet Conklin. Why, Walter Denton, you've been wearing your glasses again. <laughs> what about Harriet? Well, I'm afraid it's a pretty long story. That's all right. I have a pretty long ear. <laughs> well, as you know, Miss Brooks, Harriet Conklin is the daughter of Mr. Conklin. Granted. Who, in turn, is married to Harriet's mother, Mrs. Conklin. It all started the night before last. See, I told you it was a long story. Only the way you tell it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the night before last, I had a date with Harriet to go to the movies. But when I got to her house to pick her up, she acted like I had bubonic plague or something. Did you? I mean, <laughs> what did she do? Well, she said that she couldn't be bothered with me anymore because a tall, dark man was coming into her life. Her too? <laughs> Must be an epidemic. Where did she find out about this tall, dark man? Well, that's where mother comes in. Maybe there's a shorter way to listen to this story. <laughs> Her mother and Harriet had taken out the Ouija board that afternoon. That's when they found out about this tall guy. Well, after all, Walter, you can't compete with a non-existent rival. That's just the trouble. He's not non-existent. He's not? No, he materialized yesterday. Oh, now, Walter, please. No, it's I... true, Miss Brooks. Harriet told me all about him when I called yesterday evening, although I wasn't going to after the way she treated me the evening before. But when I did, she told me that this tall, dark French teacher had checked in at their house to give her father his papers before he began teaching French at school today. I know you're telling me something because I can see your lips moving. <laughs> what is it, Walter? Well, don't you understand, Miss Brooks? It's called an exchange deal. This teacher came over from Paris, France. What did we send them? Two outfielders and a shortstop? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, but I do know that Harriet sounded like this French teacher was a combination of Maurice Chevrolet and... and... I know. <laughs> Maurice Chevrolet and Charles Buick. <laughs> I was going to say Charles Boyer. <laughs> That's what I was afraid you were going to say. This teacher must be quite an interesting personality. What's his name? Let's see now. Well, there's an article about him in the school paper. Oh, I know, it's Manette. Jack Wee's Manette. <laughs> Jack Wee's Manette? Oh, you mean Jacques Monet. Say, that is a romantic-sounding name, all right. I'll bet he's a very nice person. Oh, it's not him I'm worried about. It's Harriet. Since he showed up, she thinks the Ouija board is infallible. The Ouija board? Oh, that's ridiculous. Harriet's much too sensible to... Why, <laughs> I'm surprised at her. Next thing you know, she'll be having her tea leaves read. Three children? <laughs> Our 
Little Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Doctors, leading skin specialists, prove palm olive soap using nothing but palm olive can bring lovelier complexions, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. Less oily skin for Helen Vixen, Minneapolis. Fresher, brighter color for Clara Franklin, San Francisco. Smoother, younger-looking skin for Rochelle Brouchard, New York City. Yes, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advised using palm olive for 1,285 women, many with complexion problems. Some had dry skin, some oily, some dull and coarse-looking. And using palm olive alone, nothing else, two out of three won fresher, brighter skin. Now, here's the plan these doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Massaging for one minute with palm olive soft lather. This cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive beautifying effect. Rinse. Do this three times a day for 14 days. It's that simple. But remember, leading skin specialists prove this plan really works, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. So try palm olive soap this way, using nothing but palm olive, as these doctors advised, for a lovelier complexion. For loveliness all over, use big, thrifty bath size palm olive in your tub or shower. Well, here we are, Miss Brooks. Thanks, Walter, and don't worry too much about losing Harriet's affections. I'm sure the French teacher is just a passing phase in her life. Say, there's Harriet on the steps. I'll go find a place to park. See you later, Miss Brooks. All right, Walter. Hello there, Harriet. What? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. You'll have to forgive me if I seem to be in a reverie. But I've heard about your Ouija board. I don't care what anybody says, Miss Brooks. There must be something to it. Imagine the very next day he came along. It's the first time I've ever seen capital letters in conversation. <laughs> he must be quite attractive. Attractive isn't the word, Miss Brooks. No, what is the word? Heavenly. Super heavenly. Stratospherically heavenly. <laughs> oh, please, Harriet. I'll come up a little if you'll come down a little. <laughs> oh, wait till you see him, Miss Brooks. He's... He's... Adjust safety belt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, Harriet, I think it's all very natural for a schoolgirl to have crushes. I had them myself. You, Miss Brooks? Yes, me, Miss Brooks. I wasn't born an English teacher, you know. I also think it's perfectly normal for a girl your age to think like a schoolgirl in other ways. But I do say this, and I mean it sincerely, Harriet. You don't have to act like a schoolgirl. But don't anyway, But you are the principal's daughter, Harriet, no? May we, Monsieur Monet, may we? <laughs> oh, this is Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks, je suis enchanté. That is, I've heard so much about you. But it is, uh, how do you say, understatement. You're so youthful, so lovely. Why, you're like a pupil, not a teacher. <laughs> what I mean, Run along, Harriet. You'll be late for school. <laughs> but we're at school. Oh, when did that get here? <laughs> Something is wrong. Wrong? Oh, I should say not, Monsieur Monet. It's just that, well, we don't meet such distinguished visitors every day, and, well, they must have given at least three outfielders and two shortstops for him. Pardon? Oh, uh, it's just a figure of speech. Oh, and a lovely figure you have, too. <laughs> oh, this is a doll. <laughs> Shall we go into the school, Monsieur Monet? Uh, oui, yes. I have to stop at Monsieur Conklin's office. You, uh, you show me where it is, huh? No? I, I show you where is it, uh, yes. <laughs> and I hope Mr. Boynton sees us together. Uh, I'll direct Monsieur Monet to Daddy's office, Miss Brooks. Oh, you won't have time, Harriet. You have to freshen up before your class. Freshen up? But I just stepped out of the shower. Then give yourself a rub down. You'll catch cold. <laughs> this way, Monsieur. <laughs> Come 
Well, it's our new French teacher. Good morning, Monsieur Manet. Bonjour, Monsieur Conklin. Uh, excuse me, I mean good morning. Hi, Daddy. Hello, Harriet. Uh, Mr. Conklin, I just came in to volunteer my assistance if you're looking for somebody to show Mr. Monet around the school. I told Miss Brooks that I'd be glad to take Mr. Monet, Daddy. Of course, I'd need your permission to cut one of my classes. Maybe English. I'm pretty well advanced in that. Me too. Maybe we both could cut it. <laughs> Please. Please, I would not want either of you to, uh, how do you say, put out yourselves. Oh, it would be silly to put out ourselves now. After all, we just started to blaze. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be able to show Mr. Monet the rope. But, Daddy, you're too busy. Oh, much too busy, Daddy. I mean... <laughs> I have a study period coming up in which I have I don't I have want to hear any more about it. I'm sure Mr. Monet wouldn't want us to feel that because of him, our entire system was disrupted. Oh, certainly not. I can find my, my own way about the premises. I'm sure that... Well, in that case, come along, Harriet. You're in my first class, you know. Oh, one moment, Miss Wilkes. Would you do me the great honor of perhaps having lunch avec, uh, uh, with me? With pleasure. <laughs> Oh, but I did have a date with Mr. Boynton. Hmm, I think I'll keep that date, too. Maybe it'll open his eyes a little. Uh, I'll see you in the cafeteria, Mr. Monet. But I thought Mr. Monet was going to have lunch with us. Didn't you tell me you were going to invite him to the house, Daddy? Invite him? Uh, well, I suppose so. Uh, thank you just the same, Monsieur, but I would rather not leave the school proper during my first day. Ah, an admirable spirit, Monet. If more of our homegrown teachers had it, Madison High School would be a better place in which to learn something. Something like English, for example. <laughs> yes. Well, as the little boy in the Fisk ad says, it's time to retire. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Uh, how are you today? Fine, thanks. I'm glad I caught you before your class got in. I, I wanted to ask you about lunch. Oh, I'll be happy to join you. Thanks very much. Oh. <laughs> well, I had other plans, but how can I resist an invitation like that? By the way, Mr. Boynton, do you speak any foreign language? Just American. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Mr. Boynton, you're getting quite a sense of humor. Must catch it from your frogs. <laughs> really, though, do you speak French, for instance? No, I don't. Then you wouldn't know what a French person would be saying to me if he said it in French, would you? No, I wouldn't. Good. <laughs> this may be a very interesting lunch for all of us. All of us? Yes, you see, there's a new teacher in school. Oh, you, you mean Jacques Monet? You've met him? Oh, yes. I had to deliver some papers to Mr. Conklin's home yesterday, and he was there. Oh, he's a prince of a chap. We had quite a time together. It'd be nice to see him again at lunch. Oh, it will. Oh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll uh, have to apologize to him for me. I'm afraid I'll be a little late. Oh, you will? That's too bad, Mr. Boynton. Why will you be late? Well, it's McDougal here. You know, my bullfrog. He's got me worried, Miss Brooks. It's his throat. He can't seem to croak above a whisper. Oh, that's too bad. Poor McDougal. Hi, Mac. <laughs> he must have gargled. <laughs> it did sound pretty good, but... No, I'll still have to stay close to him to see how the medication I'm giving him catches on. I'll get to lunch as soon as I can, though. Ah, oh, good old Jacques Monet. He's a real man's man. You've been wrong before, Brother Boynton, but never like this. <laughs> Here's a nice table, Mr. Monet. Let's sit down. Oui. Uh, yes, Miss Brooks. This is certainly a big restaurant. It's a cafeteria, Mr. Monet. Uh, yes. Uh, now then, shall we look at the carte du jour, bill of fare? Bill of fare? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean menu. They don't have any menus here, Mr. Monet. No? Then how do you select an order? Well, here you don't exactly select an order. You just sort of point and holler. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you in a minute. But first, I'd like to ask a little favor, Mr. Monet. As you know, Mr. Boynton is joining us for lunch. Oh, yes. Yes, fine fellow, Mr. Boynton. A real uh, man's man. On him it fits. <laughs> I mean, he is a very nice man, but he's sort of shy. Shy? Mm -hmm. Why should he be shy? He is tall, muscular, 
with a fine head of hair, good teeth, pleasing manner. What else is new? <laughs> what I wanted to ask of you is very simple. You see, Mr. Boynton is too bashful to ask you himself, but I'm sure he'd get a tremendous kick. That is, he'd enjoy it if you spoke nothing but French during our lunch. But why? Well, he's trying to learn how to speak your language. He understands it fine, but he's not sure of his pronunciation. He could learn a lot from you about a lot of things. <laughs> well, I suppose I could help him. He's coming over now, Mr. Manet. Uh, remember how you kissed my hand this morning? Uh, Would you do it again, please? What? Uh, but uh, Quickly, I... Mr. Manet. It's part of Mr. Boynton's education. <laughs> Hurry, here, my hand. Uh, Miss Brooks, I don't like to be, how do you say, gouchy, but you're pushing out one of my feelings. <laughs> What's the trouble, Mr. Monet? Got something caught in your teeth? <laughs> Just an old cuticle of mine. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Comment ça va aujourd'hui, monsieur? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, how do you like our cafeteria? C'est bon. Mr. Monet says it's lovely, but not half as lovely as I am. Why, Mr. Monet, how flattering. <laughs> well, let's see now. What do we eat today? Well, uh, how about the roast beef? That's what I'm going to have. Me too. How about you, Mr. Monet? Tell him in French. Uh, je désire un petit mamite, ou vichysoise, une salade et d'un tranche de rose beef, des haricots verts, des crêpes suzettes et une demi-tasse. Oh, Mr. Monet, you and your compliments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now stop that and tell Mr. Boynton what you want to eat. <laughs> But I do not understand. I, uh, uh, Mr. Monet, uh, hmm? uh, quel voulez-vous manger? Mr. Uh, Boynton, you little spy, you can speak French. Uh, well, no, I can't, Miss Brooks, not really. Those are just a few words I picked up when I was in the Army. The Army? You were stationed in New Orleans, and you know it. But near the French Quarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let us not delay any longer. I don't suppose they have what I really want for lunch, but maybe, eh? Do they ever have fog's legs? What? Oh, don't say it, <laughs> Mr. Manet. <laughs> well, uh, why not? Frog's legs are delicious to eat. Let's all have them, eh? Me? Eat frog's legs? I'd feel like a... like a cannibal. If you'll excuse me, I, I'm afraid I've lost my appetite. I'll, I'll see you later, Miss Brooks. Why, uh, why would he feel like a cannibal if he ate frog's legs? He is not a frog. <laughs> Only in some ways is he not a frog, Mr. Manet. But don't worry about Mr. Boynton now. Oh, yes, you're right. You're right, Miss Brooks. You know, in a way, in a way, I'm glad we're alone. There is something I would like to ask you. You see, I, I have been searching for just the right one ever since I come to America. And now, now, well, I feel that my search is at an end. You are the one I've been searching for. Oh, Mr. Monet. But Mr. Boynton's gone now. You don't have to talk like that to me. It's... Oh, I don't think of Mr. Boynton. I, I think of you, Miss Brooks. Ma chère, Miss Brooks. I have something personal to talk to you about. But right now I'm late for an appointment with Mr. Conklin. Can you meet me someplace right after school? How about the Casbah? I mean... <laughs> I mean the park, Mr. Fine, Mr. fine. Of course, I have several papers to mark, and besides, I have to formulate my plans for tomorrow's class, and... There are some other routine affairs I must take care of. Oh, I realize this. How long will it all take? Well, school doesn't let out until three, and it's a 20-minute walk to the park. Would 310 be all right? <laughs> I, I will come right to the point, Miss Brooks. I have met you here in the park to make you what you call a proposal. Proposal? But, Mr. Monet, you hardly know me. Oh, I know you well enough for this, Miss Brooks. After talking to many, many women, Mrs. Conklin, little Mrs. Conklin, about Harriet, mm. I mean, I know you are the ideal woman for me. Oh, this is very flattering, Mr. Monet, but marriage is a serious step. Marriage? I cannot marriage with you. I am already married. With you? <laughs> Well, with my wife, Helene. She arrives here next week. For you, I have another proposal. Any other proposal is only good for a sock in the nozzle. <laughs> no, no, 
you, you do not understand. I want you to accept a position as tutor for my three children. Three children? Oh, Mrs. Davis will love this. Well, they need very badly coaching in English before they can enter school here. And, well, what do you say, Miss Brooks? Will you help us out? Mr. Monet, may I ask you one question? Of course. What is it? Among your children, is there a tall, dark one in the crowd? <laughs> Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl. Beautiful luster cream girl, you owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I promised Mr. Monet I'd help him out with his children, but I must admit I was a little let down when I found out he wasn't a bachelor. And I said as much to Mrs. Davis. Yes, Connie, it's a shame that such a darling man is already married. But he served his purpose as far as upsetting Mr. Boynton goes. What do you mean, Connie? Well, the day after we had lunch together, Mr. Boynton was so concerned about the situation, guess what he did? What? He put a brand new lock on his frog's cage. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, and Gerald Moore. <laughs> Dentists know what cleans teeth best. And over 4,000 dentists say Colgate tooth powder with a two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to remove dull film and get your teeth shining clean, just brush teeth two minutes morning and night with Colgate tooth powder. Brush inside, outside, and biting surfaces. Always brush away from the gums. See how this gets teeth naturally bright. It removes dull film that improper brushing misses. And Colgate tooth powder also sweetens your breath. Try it. Buy Colgate Tooth Powder today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Do you want to be free to work where you choose, start your own business, own your own home, invest your money as you see fit? Then the American way of life is best for you. We have the highest standard of living. Since 1910, we have practically doubled our annual income, yet our working time has been cut by about 18 hours a week. Let's start to realize how fortunate we are. Let's work a little harder on our jobs and at being better citizens. Let's remember that the better we produce, the better we live. Stay tuned now for Lum and Abner. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.